So, uh, yeah, hello, welcome to everyone. Thanks very much for coming to this, as Karen said, fourth and final event in the Rethinking Class in the 21st Century series. So this time it's presented in conjunction with BunkerCast, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. If you haven't heard of that podcast, maybe check it out. Um, so I'm George, I'm one of the hosts of the podcast, joined by, by Catherine Liu and Dan Evans, as you've already heard, um, and just wanted to give them a bit of a more formal introduction. So uh, Dan is an on-again, off-again academic. He wrote his book while working um, as a homelessness support worker, but he is now back in academia, teaching criminology at Swansea University and researching trade unions at Cardiff University. He is, as previously mentioned, but repeated again, um, repeater, um, of this book, A Nation of Shopkeepers, The Unstoppable Rise of the Petty Bourgeoisie, which came out earlier this year. Um, Catherine is Professor of Film and Media Studies at the University of California, at Irvine and is the author of Virtue Hoarders, The Case Against the profession, uh, Professional Managerial Class, which came out in 2021, and is also the author of the very cleverly named Cluanon uh, substack, so check that out as well. So, okay, so we're here today to talk about the professional managerial class and its politics. Um, so previous events in this series have been about labels like are the, you know, middle, well actually Dan, could probably tell tell you all better than I can. Well, put me on spot here. Um, right. So the other, the previous events have been. <laughs> the first one was on the new petty bourgeoisie with uh, Tom Gunn and myself. The second one was on the lumpen proletariat, um, or so the, the lumpenisation of the working class, with me and Dom Hunter, the author of uh, Child Solidarity, and. Last the last one two weeks ago was uh, with Michaela uh, Farley and myself, um, Rafferty, Michaela Rafferty, sorry, uh, Michaela Rafferty, uh, and it was about the role of class in the education system. I know this. Cool. So if that's the first three today, professional managerial class. So there's a lot of discussion today. Similar terms: professional managerial class, petty bourgeoisie. Um, other similar concepts, the transferia, living off um, state and philanthropic subsidies. Um, Michael Lint in America talking about the managerial overclass, the top 10% of college educated Americans. Um, you've got Christophe Guy in France talking about the peripheral France in conflict with the new bourgeoisie who were se sequestered in their kind of, um, you know, sit the new citadels in urban centres or Joel Kotkin talking about the new clerisy of um, ideological legitimation priests 
in the coming neo-feudalism. So there's clearly a lot of discussion today about this kind of new or maybe re-emerged um, middle class. How do we talk about it? What are the terms that we should use? And politically, you know, what's important to this group? So I wanted to kick off um, by asking both the two of you, you know, why did you write this book? What were you, uh, what were you hoping to achieve? So Dan, over to you first. Okay. Um, so my book, if you haven't read it, is about the petty bourgeoisie. Um, I class the petty bourgeoisie in uh, the book as being comprised of two fractions. The first is the what I call the traditional petty bourgeoisie, which is comprised of um, small, solo, self-employed people, which is a, a group of people that has grown enormously. Marx obviously said that the small self-employed are gonna disappear and the sort of monopoly capital, but they haven't, they've grown. Uh, and then the other fraction, which is the I call the new petty bourgeoisie, uh, which is like downwardly mobile, uh, over-educated graduates, sometimes living like with their parents and things. Uh, so basically me, you know, uh, sort of tragic, often quite tragic people. Um, and uh, so I, I've always been obsessed with the petty bourgeoisie. You know, I come, I come from a small, small low middle class town. You know, I wrote my PhD on um, the, the petty bourgeoisie. Um, and it's just the milieu that I, I know best. You know, I've, I still love like crushed grey velvet and all the sort of aesthetics that people associate with like the nominal classes. Um, in terms of why I wanted to write the book, um, I just felt that, you know, like the, the British uh, commentariat or like the British left um, had sort of given up on sociologically understanding you know, popular conservatism. You know, why do people vote Tory? You know, why have we got permanent uh, Tory hegemony in the UK? You know, why don't people vote for the Labour Party? Um, and I think part of that is like, you know, about method, with a massive reliance on polling in the UK. You know, people just, no one asks yeah. anyone anything. They just read, read off polls. Um, but I thought it was like a moral angle. You know, we've sort of uh, collapsed into this like American liberal uh, view of the world as being neatly defined neatly divided between like good and bad people you know so like there's loads of, the uk is terrible um because we always vote conservative people who vote tory are evil so there's like bad people and there's good people um and that was particularly i thought noticeable after brexit you know when uh, i was in cardiff university at the time working and i got increasingly disturbed at the way people were talking about people who voted leave which is obviously, you know, my friends, people in my community, uh, they were talking about them almost using the language of eugenics, you know, these people shouldn't be allowed to vote, you know, they shouldn't be allowed to have kids and all this sort of stuff, and I found it really uncomfortable. Um, and then I guess related to that was I, I thought that we, we don't really understand the class structure in the UK, because after Brexit, people started talking about the Red Wall, the Red Wall, you know, this concept of the Red Wall, this as if, you know, everywhere in the UK that voted Labour was just like homogenous, a uh, working class place full of like working class authoritarian people who just magically voted conservative. Um, and obviously if, you, you know, if you're from those places you realise that the class structure is actually a lot more complicated than this. It's not a uniformly working class place at all. And in fact if you look at the statistics, you know, the backbone of the Brexit vote and the modern conservative vote is actually the low middle classes um, who are now enormous. That's the same in and that's the same in um, the US. So I guess I first, I really, I'm aware I'm rambling a bit, but I wanted to write the book firstly, I guess, to sort of defend, you know, um, right. my own community, you know, my community, and sort of say, well, these people aren't actually fascistic, uh, sort of reactionaries, uh, which I think is a fun, <laughs> quite a fundamental thing, thing to do, you know. Um, if you want to build a socialist project, you shouldn't actually think that everyone you want to, you know, the, a massive percentage of the population should be written off. Um, so that was the first thing, but I didn't want to get sucked into like, you know, standpoint epistemology, you know, this is my lived experience. Um, and I want, I thought by explaining, you know, this community and, you know, why they vote conservative, you can sort of start to understand the modern class structure, you know, um, the rise of modern conservatism and so on. Right, um, right. no, and yeah, thanks. Good, good um, background, which was also in the book as well. So if you haven't read that, I will, I will start plugging the books at, at some point. Um, and I also did neglect to say, after Karen asked me to, that yes, this is going to be released as an audio episode of the podcast. I should have said that 
obviously right at the beginning. Um, so if you do ask a question and you would not like that question to be on the podcast, um, maybe come and see me afterwards and we can scratch it from the recorded record. But um, hopefully, given we're recording it um, for video, everyone's okay with that. Um, but yeah, sorry for that uh, interjection. But um, yeah, Catherine, so your book came out to uh, 2021, so a few years earlier. Yeah. Virtue Hoarders, what, what, what did you want to achieve with that? Well, um, so um, I never thought in my lifetime I would see a declared socialist um, running for president with really, really good chance of winning, right? 2016, 2020. But um, Bernie Sanders' campaign really galvanized, you know, certain segments of the left that I felt were um, sort of passively waiting for someone like that. But more importantly... For me, unlike Dan, I was looking at why and how the professional managerial class was not voting for Bernie Sanders, but was um, sort of ramming Hillary Clinton down my throat during the 2016 Democratic um, um, primaries. And, you know, I'd always been like a closet socialist. I'd never felt like I wanted to um, declare myself su as such because academic Marxists in America are kind of funny. But um, um, I, um, and when that 2016 campaign sort of launched, I noticed two things in 2020 confirmed this too. I campaign for Sanders, I am the world's worst you know, door knocker, but I found that in my neighborhood, which is made up of entirely liberal professional managerial class professors, because they developed a community for us right outside the university, that there was a, an appalling number of people who thought that even what, contemplating a Sanders vote was ridiculous. And these were like, you know, allegedly rational liberal people and if you know the state of national health care, of not national, of privatized health care in the United States, of the sort of, um, you know, collapsing infrastructure, of the absolute exploitation of working class people and the wage compression and just the demoralization of anything that's not in, within the urban core, um, you'd think that like rational people, even looking at the numbers, would say, you know, we need to, we need a real change. The Democratic Party needs to change. But these people were t completely saturated by a kind of liberal ideology. We need incrementalism. We need reformism. Um, someone said recently, well, I'll never forget this, in 2020 when I knocked on doors for Sanders, my um, neighborhood, he goes, I'm still studying the issues. And I was like, there's not going to be a test. You know, this is not about how smart you are. But, you know, I, I would actually get mad, which is like really bad for a door knocker. But, um, but the other thing that I noted while I was knocking doors at the same time was that there was a kind of anger and demobilization on the part of working class people. And I, for some reason, could totally empathize with um, the working class protest vote that elected Trump eventually in 2016. Like when the my, when that happened, I was like, you know, there's a core of me. Like I don't want to be standpoint epistemology, but maybe because I came from a very working class peasant family that rose up in the ranks because of post war social mobility, completely by accident. Um, I just felt like more identified with these people than with my colleagues who were like, oh, Kelly Clinton, she's the most qualified person ever. And I'm like, you know, this is, the, the, these are all the people who did really well in school, who always raised their hands first, and they <clears throat> dominate, did left liberal politics. And this is what John and Barbara Ehrenreich wrote about in 1977, mm -hmm. that in the post-68 left, what, whatever you want to call it, was completely dominated by college educated credential elites and in 77 that was one thing and it's only gotten worse since so that's why hmm. and, and, so, and, uh, so, you, so you kind of uh, you wrote the book because you you don't like your neighbors and that and you kind of you wrote the book because, because you, you kind love of your because you kind of do like them I guess it's just good to have that, those starting points um, so Thanks, Catherine, George. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, it, that did come across, I think, quite clearly. Um, and and you, you, you seem sympathetic in that portrayal, uh, let me just add. Um, but you've, you've come uh, from uh, Germany and, and Poland, the, the, the World Book Tour um, for the book. So just to kind Polish of... translation. Um, yeah, I mean, available in Polish and German and English, so you can 
you know practice yeah practice um but yeah um, i guess the question is has there been anything interesting in the way the book's been received either when you've been talking about it in america or talking about it in germany or poland um anything to kind of to draw out of that experience well interestingly enough the mainstream left like the nation did not review my book but um there were there was an incredible um um sort of popular podcast sort of like um un disorganized left media response to it and then like certain right wing places like spikes online like compact they really were interested in this question of class because they're interested in you know the dealignment of the working class from the democratic party um but i have to say you know i'm not going to complain there there's been a really really great reception of the book in poland there is a very small like materialist left the most people in the pmc want are aspirational americans so they signed on those odd line to every american policy and um they are very very virulently against like any remnants of the communist past but there are really committed people who've been educated in this tradition and they've been really um uh, open to this book they're enthusiastically embracing the book in germany the red green alliance is falling apart everybody hates the greens and the green party of germany if you don't know this is now polling below the afd the extreme right the alternative for for germany party and um there's a lot of interest in like reviving the class question because the green party is like the apotheosis of the PMC they they really look down on the german working class they don't they they want to be the vanguard of some kind of environmental um but non-social non-political um vanguardism and so it's been an interesting i've already had three reviews in the major papers mm. in germany so this is um dan did you find similar sort of thing to what catherine was describing there you know essentially you know again i'm gonna just continue to crudely summarize what the two of you say um strip out all the nuance um but we need to do that to keep keep it moving essentially mainstream left didn't want to talk about class didn't want to kind of talk about the book um, yeah, just, just before we get on, on to that, I, I do want to echo what Catherine said. Not I'm going to jump in and say how much I hate um, my colleagues and things like that in, in academia, but but like there is this, there is a, a real sense, and a re, it is very uncomfortable. And you know, Bourdieu would call it like habitus clash, or whatever. You know, when you, you're in these um, environs or whatever, and people are saying things about uh, the, the you know essentially the working class or the low middle classes, and it's just people just don't understand the scale of the alienation. You know, they don't understand the scale of the alienation from politics at all. And they just can't comprehend. They can't just physically, or physically, they just can't. They can't comprehend why people would be turned off politics. And that is, it's almost like an insurmountable gulf when you're trying to explain yeah. why people would be frustrated. It's like, well, oh. and then obviously it comes out. Well, my life's pretty good, <laughs> so I can't understand it. But in terms of the reception for, of the book, um, so obviously when I was writing, I was chatting to my friends and chatting to my uh, chatting to one of the editors repeated and they were like well you know there's a chance the book will be like universally unpopular because you know you're sort of um not only you saying like the, uh, the sort of Corbyn movement um wasn't like a working class movement um and obviously people have very uh emotionally attached to this idea that they're working class you know they've found that a lot you know people a lot of the sort of young graduates or the Catherine would call the pmc are extremely attached to this notion that we are the new working class with the vanguard of the revolution, um, and I guess the book was essentially puncturing that. Um, but obviously, in a, what I thought was a comradely way from the inside, you know, wearing my Corbyn T-shirt, um, just to show, <laughs> just to prove it. Um, and um, and then the other thing, obviously, I was saying in the book was that like, essentially a lot of these people who vote Tory aren't so bad, um, which again goes against you know a lot of people are basically nice people, which goes against this moralising tendency to sort of judge large swathes of the population and sort of you know, deplorables. Um, but, you know, and the reaction is, the reaction has been, you know, some parts have been amazing, some parts has been sort of disappointing. You know, I'm extremely privileged and happy that, I, you know, places like Hausman's, uh, the Women Class Movement Library, uh, a bunch of other independent bookstores in, in Wales have, have had a really great reception. Um, when I wrote the book, I wanted it to be like a popular introduction to class, because obviously a lot of stuff on the left is very impenetrable, a lot of academic stuff you know, mm. basically just can't read it, you know, so people will say, oh, I've read that, and I'm like, mm. <laughs> oh, I, like, I haven't read it, um, because I can't read it, so, and like, you know, I've had 
you know, my friends in Portugal have said, oh, I read your book, you know, um, and then I get like abused about it, you know, oh, you saw the dictionary or something like that. Um, but nonetheless, I thought, well, it, you know, it's, it's reached beyond what I thought the, the bubble, so I was happy with that. And then I've had, you know, done a lot of great podcasts with it. Um, but it's almost like Catherine said, almost like a grassroots, uh, you know, ground soil where like, you know, Nick and people like Housemans have, have loved it. Um, I've had some good reviews, but on the other hand, when it's come up against what I would call may, maybe the sort of official uh, organs or gatekeepers of, of the left, it's almost been like a, hmm. a, 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 wall of, a wall of silence. You know, caveat that with, um, I, I, I'm not going to burn any bridges because like, I'm desperate to actually like, no, break I'll, into I'll, the PMC, you know, so I really want to <laughs> really get there. So I'll, 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 jump, I'll jump in there before you start naming any names and actually burning <laughs> any of those bridges. Um, but, but I, just, no, I guess just wanted but, to... But, but there is a reluctance, an obvious reluctance yeah. to talk about class. And some of the comments I've I already think, had online yeah. have been it's incredible. But I guess um, everyone here this evening um, is exceptions to this, to this rule. Um, so, yeah, just I guess to, to delve into the, um, the detail a little bit, um, Dan, first of all, just... So you talk about, in the book, you talk about the new petty bourgeoisie and the old petty bourgeoisie. Basically, what's the difference between the two... You know, can you paint us a picture of the, this typical member of the new petty bourgeoisie? Um, okay, so, I mean, I describe the, the petty bourgeoisie in the book as, uh, as I said, being a part of two fractions. Um, and people who've come to previous uh, talks have, have heard this joke before, but, I, but I, I describe it as a, the class as being like a DNA helix. You know, um, like I said, I don't actually know anything about DNA helixes or DNA or anything like that, but it's just something that looks like it's got two parts, so I was like, oh, that's really useful. So I used the DNA helix, right? So there's, um, as I said, you've got the old petty bourgeoisie, which is, you know, um, the, the tr traditionally seen as a small shopkeeper, a small sort of self-employed, um, and then the new petty bourgeoisie, which is uh, sort of a, a downwardly mobile, uh, over-educated no, uh, graduate, normally working in white-collar industries, like a call centre or something like that, or the lower parts of the public sector. Now. You know, when you know, obviously this and the caveat is this isn't my idea. You know, this was Nikos Palantzas's concept that he brought out in the in the seventies. And on the face of it, people were like, well, how can a graduate, you know, who's now working in a call centre, have anything in common with like a, a self-employed tradesman yeah. or a you know bricklayer or a shopkeeper or things like that? Um, and obviously, on the surface, they're very different. You know, like uh, little things like the the solo self-employed tend to be geographically uh, fixed, you know, because they're, they're stuck in a small town because they've got a business there. Um, they tend to not go to university. Um, they tend to have quite a dim view of formal education, you know, throughout history. And they, they tend to have this uh, a particular habitus, you know, personified by like Margaret Thatcher, this upright morality and piety, you know, that they used to di distinguish themselves from the working class. You know, the working class used to go down the pub, the pedagogues, you would say, oh, we're going to church or chapel or something like that. Um, and in, in contrast to that, you know, the new petty bourgeoisie, uh, quite cosmopolitan, you know, they tend to have been, uh, you know, been to university, they're graduates, they tend to live in um, cities, a lot of university cities, because you've got to go as part of the, your social mobility journey. Um, and so, yeah, and, and they tend to, and that's the other thing is, they tend to vote for progressive political parties. You know, in my book, I'm arguing that the, the basis of Corbynism and like Podemos, uh, Syriza, uh, uh, and is made up of these downwardly mobile graduates. Um, but even though there's all these cosmetic differences, what I argue in the book is that, that in many key ways they're very similar. You know, they're both fixated on social mobility. Um, you know, so the old the old shopkeeper or things like that wanted to um, acquire property and things like that to sort of stave off downward social mobility to distinguish himself from the work class. You know, the new petty bourgeoisie um, wants to be upwardly mobile but just hasn't made it um, and it's that downward social mobility which informs their politics um, they differentiate themselves in the working class you know through use, use of cultural capital um, just like the old petty bourgeoisie I'm arguing that they're the hyper in, live a quite a hyper individualized life people are on LinkedIn you know you're always looking for a new job um, and I you know I use the example in the in the book because I mean, it might be worth saying this because on paper the new petty bourgeoisie look, you know, quite similar to the to the working class, right? So if you're a new petty bourgeoisie, if you're a graduate and you are working in a coffee shop uh, and you're working in a, a call centre or whatever, and you're really pissed off about it, 
That's why you see people saying, like, we're the new working class, we're the new working class. Um, so I argue that both there's a fundamental difference between someone who is temporarily working in a, a shit job, let's say, a dead-end job, and someone who is going to be there for life, both in terms of your ideology, your aspirations, your background, uh, your, your habitus, as in your, your class, your education, your culture, things like that. Um, because a lot of the, the people who are um, in these jobs, don't, they just don't want to be there. You know, they don't want to be there, and they're constantly looking for ways out. Um, so there's a big difference, I think, between them and the working class. So just to, to I guess, to just uh, go a little bit deeper into the, the political... Is there a tension there between this old and new petty bourgeoisie? You, you kind of said they're both really interested in social mobility. Don't want to put too many words in your mouth, but the lower kind of um, the the new uh, petty bourgeoisie may be more concerned with that fear of falling, mm. and the older petty bourgeoisie looking upwards, perhaps. But maybe that's not exactly how you you would you you might not agree with that. But yeah, just in terms of the way that they act politically or the politics that they have, um, are they you know t- opposed? Are they able to act politically in a uni, kind of unitary way? How does that, how do you see that kind of working out? Um, well, in, in some ways, if you think about like modern politics, you know, I argue in the book, just like Peter Mayer and a bunch of other people, that the working class have basically vacated politics. When the, the, the most, the working class get blamed for a lot of things, you know, they vote for Trump or Boris or things like that. Um, but actually, the, one of the biggest trends within the working class and how they participate politically is they don't vote. They're totally disengaged with the, uh, the political process, and so rightly so. So, uh, as the working class has sort of exited stage left, I think that's what it is, that's the term. Um, you know, the, the the petty bourgeoisie, both fractions, have become the, the new sort of symbol of politics. You've got the the old uh, petty bourgeoisie in the UK, like the face of Brexit. You know, the, the new petty bourgeoisie are almost like the face or the symbol, the stand-ins for the sort of Corbyn movement, and they're looking across, you know, the the room at each other, and they don't really. I don't think they like what they don't think they like what they see at all. You know, the the, the, the they, so they don't seem to act in a unitary political way at all. You know, if you on I think the old petty bourgeoisie look at these sort of young graduates and see essentially see the the things they don't like about the professional managerial class. You know, the the, the same culture and, and values and norms as them. Um, and the new petty bourgeoisie look at the old petty bourgeoisie and see. Uh, you know, reaction, you know, racism, intolerance, and things like that. Um, and you can see in you know, splits during COVID, uh, during Brexit, and things like that. Um, but in but in other ways, they do act politically because they're both fixated on social mobility. Social mo- when we talk about neoliberalism, capitalism, things like that, and ideology. One of the things that keeps capitalism in place, and one of the things that keeps class society in place, is a focus on upward social mobility. That's the thing that stops people. That keeps people individualistic. That's the thing that keeps people from acting in collectives because you actually just want to get out of where you're living. Yeah? If you, wanna, you don't want to rise with your class, you want to rise out of your class. That's a dominant uh, theme in modern neoliberal society. And both fractions um, have bought into that. You know, the, the difference is, is that the old have achieved a degree of stability by normally acquiring property, like the right to buy, and that property is stopping them falling. So their politics are basically based around holding on to what they've got. So this is the thing, my house, my asset is gonna stop me fall, falling into the work class. And then you've got the new petty bourgeoisie who are downwardly mobile, they haven't got any assets, and their politics are basically about correcting that. But you know, they don't want to abolish class society, they just want to take up their rightful place in the middle. You know, they want to make, they want to, if you, and if you look at some of the arguments people make, you know, um, even in the, the current white collar strikes at the moment, you know, the junior doctors, junior academics, I'm getting paid as much as a barista. Um, you know, the implication being I shouldn't be paid that much, but other people, you know, the working class should be. So it's about shoring up that position that they think they deserve in the class structure. Mm-hmm. It's, not a, a, it's, it's not a group of people who want to smash class society, you know, it's about people who want to take up their place in it. Take up their, yeah, rightful place. No, I think that's a, um, a great description the two different fractions of the petty bourgeoisie that defines a lot of the political conflict we see in um, we see in Britain, maybe see in America as well. Um, I guess following on from that, Catherine. So we just heard Dan's account. I think potentially really useful of the petty bourgeoisie. This you know this term. There's two different parts of it. Um, so why why did you not use this term? It's probably got a, a longer tradition in you know within Marxism. Um, but PMC. This is a uh, you know why why use this term? 
Well, I, I found it really compelling in terms of um, Barbara and John Ehrenreich's um, essay from 77. I wasn't looking so much at the right-left dynamic, which I think is really interesting. I was really looking at the internal dynamics of, dem of the Democratic Party and its demographics and how, you know, and partially how the Democratic Party, which is supposedly the party of the left, has com is losing its working class base. And so that is, that is the main concern of my critique in many ways, and about and this ideology of, um, main, of um, social mobility still maintains its power within a division that it wants to be very clear about, which is that there are those who have gone to college and there are those who are, have not, and those who have not are still make up 65% of the American population, but the Democratic Party acts like we can just, we've got them hostage, they're going to vote for us, and we're going to just be vanguardists on the cultural fronts, and the working class won't vote for Republicans, they'll just vote for us, and so we can do whatever we want, basically, get in the pockets of billionaires, and so that, that, that's the dynamic that I was really looking at. And I also think that this class in the United States, college-educated, credentialed elites who are supposed to behave like professionals, had an idea from the early 20th century when, if you think of them as pretty bourgeois, they were looking at the working class unrest, the rise of the socialist parties, the absolute misery of the American working class, the massive violence that was being um, uh, imposed on the working class through all the Pullman strikes, etc. And they actually had a moment of being progressive. They want, they were on the side of the working class. Um, from John Dewey to Jacob Rees to Jane Addams, who invented social work. Jacob Rees invented muckraking journalism. John Dewey put um, the tenure system in place in the United States. They were looking at the depredations of the market and trying to modify, reform, um, the structures of American capitalism. I mean, I always tell my students, like, you all think, like, billionaires are so cool because they're Elon Musk, but in the 19-teens, you know, they were, like, really fat, gout, they, in popular culture, they were represented as top-headed, fat, gouty decadence, and so nobody wanted to be on their side. Like, bankers were, like, the, um, you know, avatars of corruption, and it's really funny how Silicon Valley re reconfigured that as just like someone who's super smart, you know. Mark Zuckerberg is just so smart. That's why yeah, he became a, a billionaire. Just yeah. a guy wearing a gray t shirt and a hoodie and, and a vest. And, and I, yeah. I had, yeah, I presented so, you with your Silicon Valley. So yeah. I actually just wanted to jump in there. So Dan's book, A Nation of Shopkeepers, um, identifies one of the main kind of types of the petty bourgeoisie. When you talk about the PMC in the American context or even in the British context, who who is the like the the, the most PMC person the, or the classic example of, of this kind of class, the avatar um, of this kind of group? I, I was going to say Hillary Clinton, but that's um, that's a, like an old old um, example now. I and actually I think it's Barack Obama. So he went he um, he came from. Um, an educated um, layer of American society. He's, his mother had a Fulbright. Well, he spoke many languages. He's very cosmopolitan. And yet he went and did community organizing, whatever that was, for a year and a half in Chicago before he entered the political realm. He went to, Har he went to Columbia and the Occidental College, Columbia, and then you know, Yale, Harvard Law School, I forget. But you know, he was always like the smartest guy in his class, always looked like a progressive, but, you know, if you look at his foreign policy, if you look at what he did after the 2008 financial crisis, it was all in the, to the benefit of the military industrial complex and billionaires. He, so Trump, for me, was totally connected to the way in which a Democratic president betrayed the w working class and petty bourgeois um, homeowners in America. He bailed out the banks, it, you know, the banks got billions of dollars of um, um, federal money, and nobody, there was no caveat, there was no requirement for them to forgive the mortgage loans for people who were suddenly homeless. It was like, oh, you shouldn't have taken out that loan. And I have, like, members of my family who were very wealthy, who were Democratic Party, um, you know, um, faithfuls, and they literally said, oh, it's because everyone wanted flat screen TVs. Mm -hmm. 
that's why the economy crashed. And I was like, you all are insane. And like, I'm silent screaming through this whole thing. And I realized like, I wanted to write a popular book also that wasn't going to be full of jargon. And I wasn't going to get into fights with other Marxists about whether or not this was a new class or what super, surplus value was. I was going to remain faithful to the power of Marxism as an explanatory model to understand exploitation and really like write a polemic, you know, and that was like, I just planted my flag in the, in the snow because I felt like, what else have I got to lose here? I, I have tenure. I mean, they, they could come at me. They, here's my famous academic freedom, which is being undermined all the time, but I'm going to exercise it. Use it, use it while you've, you've got it at least. I, I know guess. it's not, it's not I, wanted to, past. I wanted to push you a bit more on this. So if Obama's the kind of the, the high level, like representative, you know, who is the typical member of the professional managerial class today? What's their, I mean, it, it, because presumably they don't all have Barack Obama's background or do they? Or is, is it really quite a small fraction of American okay, society, so, oh, which is very, very credentialized? Or is um, it a bit, a bit broader I, than that? I, I don't know if you all know this, but my example of this would be like someone who went to a small liberal arts college or a very private um, posh college, and then they go out for a year or two and work for Teach for America. And then they go to law school. But, you know, but right now, if they're in the middle class and their parents aren't rich, they're going to come out of law school with like $200,000 worth of debt. But yet they feel like they've done their duty, like they've gone and they've gone to the worst neighborhoods in America and they've taught, you know, difficult kids. And instead of having like a real um, reform of the American education system, you have all these what you call charities who provide um, opportunities for credentialed elites to do a little bit of work. It's like the missionary service in the Mormon church. And then they go back to um, NGOs to, well, uh, the most elite NGOs, they go back to making tons of money. So there's that. But the, also, on the other hand, there is also this kind of um, um, financier, the quantitative analyst. Mm. Like Sam Bankman Freed of like the crypt, whatever the crypto thing that mm. fell apart was. His parents were prof prof professors. I mean, I'm a professor. My husband's a professor. But they were like Stanford professors. Like they really believe in intelligence. They really believe in smarts. His girlfriend went to MIT. And they came up with, and this is like the brutal capitalist side of things, which is still skewing Democratic Party. And they come up with this thing that is like the most you know, ridiculous grift on the financial system. And people believe them because they're smart. They think they're smart, quote unquote. And I cannot tell you how much of the American democratic liberal elite is totally like hypnotized by this idea of like, I was smart, therefore I, I deserve this and I'm gonna look for other people who are smart and um, create this utopia. And no matter how many times it fails, this cult of intelligence and information and mastery of information continues to obtain. So, mm -hmm. so just just I guess to draw out a little bit of the the contrast between the two groups that the petty bourgeoisie and the PMC that you seem to be um, developing here, Catherine, what you said seems like this: the centrality of the idea of smartness. You've got the credentialized um, NGO person. You've got the quant finance guy. Dan, with the petty bourgeoisie, you've got that kind of central idea of, you know, it's it's um, f falling or not getting to the the um, correct or deserved position in the class structure, and then the two different groups: the overemployed, uh, underemployed uh, graduate, and then maybe the the shopkeeper of the title of the book. I guess you know these are potentially quite small groups in society. I mean, is there a danger of ex essentially exaggerating? Uh, I don't want to kind of go into standpoint theory, but you may well know some people who um, may, you know. Uh, fall into these groups. Is there that danger of kind of exaggerating um, from what you know to, and trying to describe the whole political system in, in either case? Well, can I respond? Because I think Dan actually um, pointed, uh, you know, put his finger on it, which is that the actual working class and the working poor do not participate politically anymore. So one of the reasons why we're talking about these classes is because they take up so much of the media airtime, they're content creators, they're journalists, and then for in the British system, you know, you have this struggle with blaming people uh, um, for blaming actually the people who do vote 
for, you know, voting the wrong way or something like that. And in the States, we had a little bit of this as well with Trump. And I mean, a lot of this. But the question is, like, the lower you go on the income and asset level, the less political participation there is. And, you know, going back to my anecdotal bad campaigning experience, my bad campaigner, just like bad campaigner, me, experience was when I would go into these working class neighborhoods and people would tell me, I knock on the door and say, you know, can you please vote for Bernie Sanders in the California primary? And they go, you know what? I don't vote. It doesn't make a difference. They don't care about me. And I'd sit there and I'd be like, you know what? You're right. And I would like, I, I was not like going to sit there and try to convince them that, you know, they should actually vote. I would feel like they, this is coming from such an authentic place. And this person's just like being totally honest with me about it. And I have total respect for that. Um, and so, there are more of them. There are a lot of people like this. Yeah, there are. Mm -hmm. and, and so in, in the book, and obviously I read Catherine's book, I think as I was, as I was writing mine, it was, it was really spurring me on because I was like, I need to write like that, you know. Um, and and I, I sort of say that the, the, the PMC and the petty bourgeoisie are sort of the main actors in, in modern politics. And, but in terms of... You know their actual size, um, and you know the danger of saying, "Oh, that, you know, I know this guy, and he says he he says this, and therefore this is how politics works." Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things I, I I argue in the in the book is that you know, the, firstly, the the actual petty bourgeoisie proper, if we look at the uh, both fractions, is actually enormous. You know, like the the new petty uh, the new petty bourgeoisie. I didn't really want to put a, a, a sort of a number on it, but the old petty bourgeoisie. Um, you know, the small solar self-employed are close to five million people. You know, they peaked at like over five million people in 2019 before the pandemic, you know, during which a lot of uh, small businesses went to the wall. But, you know, over five million, which is nearly the size of the entire uh, public sector. So it's not an insignificant, it's, it's, it's a big class. But more than that, I was saying that, you know, beyond the class proper, you know, what's significant about the petty bourgeoisie is the conditions of life of the old petty bourgeoisie, working on your own, you know, in, comp in competition with other people, in this hyper-individualized, sort of rugged individual uh, mindset, is actually the norm. Like, even if you're not formally self-employed, um, most people now in their jobs, especially if you're like a young academic or something, you're basically in competition with other people, you're developing yourself as like a brand in competition with other people. So the, the, the actual conditions of life of, this, of the paper of, of, of are incredibly widespread. And that explains a lot of the things in British politics today. You know, why is British politics so individualised? Why is there such a hardness? Well, it's because the sort of traditional uh, experiences um, of the paper has, has, has become hedge mine. Um, and the other thing, like, like Catherine was saying about the PMC, I actually think, you know, well, if we're on about avatars, obviously Keir Starmer is, is the sort of exemplar in the UK. But, but after I finished the book, you know, I sort of became obsessed with the idea of the PMC, particularly because there's such a pushback against it in, in, in the UK and on the sort of British left. Um, and you go back to the Ehrenreichs, um, and one of the problems of the, that the people don't talk about is, is the ideology of the PMC vis-a-vis -vis the working class, right? So when the Ehrenreichs wrote the, the professional managerial class, I think it was in the 70s, um, you know, they said that the, the, the professional managerial class was sort of birthed, its function was to sort of manage the working class, to manage the surplus population, you know, teachers, social workers, probation officers, and that's still the function today. And, you know, Palantzas and other sort of Marxist theorists argue that your function, you know, what you do um, in the economy has a specific ideological uh, outcome, and it uh, impacts how you view and talk to the working class. And so what I think, and I can't, I can't remember this point if I include it in the book or not, um, you know, the, the, the PMC um, views the working class with a combination of paternalism, uh, on the one hand, like you've got to help these poor people, um, and absolute terror on the other, you know, and the problem is, is that, you know, this compulsion to help the working class, to help the poor, implicit in that is this acceptance that we have to help the poor because they're deficient in some way, they need us to look, they need us to help them. And, you know, we get tired, I mean, I obviously have spent a lot of time arguing with people on Twitter, making fun of people with, like, you know, EU flags and things like that, and, you know, saying it's like this problem with, like, Remainers and, and things like that, this sort of elitism. But I think that's almost a red herring, 
because if you look down, you know, if you drill down to the local Labour Party and, and the British Labour Party in particular, it does have a particular problem, you know, when your view of socialism and your view of it is basically you know, shot through with this paternalist ideology, and that was a core of Fabianism, and that's one of the reasons why working class people have rejected the welfare state, why they've rejected Labourism. So it's a really entrenched problem. Yeah, maybe treating the working class as objects of, of politics or of charity rather than subjects. Um, not to editorialise too much there. Um, but I just wanted to ask the two of you one one final question for throwing it out to um, to but, the but audience. Can I, can I, uh, yeah, can I yeah, say yeah, one jump thing? In. Um, jumping on Dan. So I realise that what I do is more of um, a Marxist-oriented intellectual history of liberalism. And one of the things I discovered through this work about... Um, because I'm working on a book on trauma now, is that it was in the Victorian era that in the, in your great country, um, this kind of idea of helping people who are suffering visibly really became institutionalized as charity. Um, and you make the object of your pity passive and all of the meaningful action comes from you. This is what I wrote about with the professional managerial class, but it goes much deeper than that and actually a lot of um, charity organizations in the UK are, and the United States have the same rhetorical structure as the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. <laughs> that was founded in, I think it was 1824, so I'm not quite sure about the dates, but early 19th century because ladies were very distressed at the maltreatment of horses in London. So what they wanted to do was have more water for the horses, have better care, but this was a great way for them to also punish the working class carriage drivers because they were the ones who were abusing their animals. So it was this incredibly effective ideological um, move on their part to be, to, all, to be the most compassionate and to have contempt for working class people. And in fact, charity organizations that went on to try to rescue children were the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children that was founded in 1861 in the United States was based on the RSPCA, which was about animals. So you, you can see how um, all of this is linked up with the kind of liberal ideology that we have today. Yeah, I have, I have so many follow-up questions on that, but that isn't. <laughs> we can um, discuss discuss that in the audience questions or in, in the pub later. Um, fascinating stuff, actually. But I did want to just before going out to questions from everyone who's who's kindly spent their evening listening to three of us so far. Um, so drawing out some of the, I guess, the trends or the conflicts within the petty bourgeoisie within the PMC, what, what comes next? You know, is, is it so simple as to say that, well, actually, I, I don't want to give you easy answers, um, but, you know, we're in the post-Bernie uh, moment. We've got some, we've got a Corbyn T-shirt here. Um, at this, you know, just for listeners of the podcast, um, this is Dan, Dan wearing this. What, yeah, what, what happens next, post-Bernie, post-Corbyn? Um, yeah, it doesn't matter how many times I wear, like, a Corbyn T-shirt, people still call me, like, you know, fascist adjacent or like red brown or whatever, <laughs> just if I say the word class people on, on scumbags. Um, I don't know if yeah, keep that in, I think. Um, but, um, <laughs> but um, like, so, so for me, what Catherine's saying that, you know, and what I was trying to say about the, um, the, the ideology of the professional managerial class, uh, which I think really like, is central to uh, the modern Labour Party, you know, the rooted in Fabianism, because the, the ILP tradition of like, the actual socialist element has, has been jettisoned. So in terms of what happens next, like, um, I mean, I argue in the book that, you know, the petty bourgeoisie, uh, the traditional petty bourgeoisie, like the old small self-employed, can go left or right, you know, admittedly, that is quite a hard sell, you know, to say that the basis of, you know, the main social base of fascism and the main social base of uh, uh, Conservative Party, you know, can actually be won over to the left. But if you look at the history of, um, you know, socialism in the UK, it was the petty bourgeoisie that were uh, found, you know, mainly behind Chartism, uh, the early anarchist movement, um, and you know, and across the, the world, you know, they haven't always gone gone right. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, I was sort of heartened, you know, by the I was heartened by the recent strike wave. Um, I mean. We sort of got a bit carried away with that because I think it's uh, limping away. Um, 
but you know, you, what was significant was there was there was a lot of support for the strikers. You know, there was a couple of weeks where Sunak started trying to attack the sort of rail workers and the posties and, and the nurses, and then he realised how it just wasn't going to work. And you know, uh, the, the opinion polls of show consistent support for the strikers. Um, the challenge in the UK is to link up the working class movement, or what's left of the working class movement, and it's very, very small, and you know, I'd probably class the Postal Workers Union and the RMT as the vanguard of what's left of the organised working class. The challenge is actually to build class alliances. You know, like we've all sort of given up on the idea of what politics is. You know, politics about class alliances. If you read like Lenin, Trotsky, Gramsci, you're very clear, you know, the working class, you can't Win power alone. You know, it, it has to sort of uh, lead these other these other allied classes, and like you know, you need the working class movement to link up with the, the sort of old petty bourgeoisie because the working class it, were getting active. And, and you know, Mick Lynch says the working class is back. Well, across Europe, like the petty bourgeoisie are back. You know, through the truckers' protests, you know, the farmers' protests in uh, in Holland and and everywhere else. They sort of and the petty bourgeoisie when they get angry, they just. It's, it's chaos, you know, they go and just drive a, a like a, a tractor into a town and just spray like manure everywhere. It's this really disorganised, um, sort of wild form of political protest, which was why, you know, Lenin and a bunch of other people always saw them as, as dangerous. But the, people look at France in the UK all the time and say, why can't we be more like France? You know, why can't we be more militant? The reason the current French protests are succeeding is because it is de facto a class alliance. French trade unions are linking up with the Yellow Vests. And the Yellow Vests are basically um, the, the example of French like par, ex, par excellence, par excellence, um, of a petty bourgeois movement because they've got extremely chaotic politics. So on the one hand, they're anti-immigrant in many ways. On the other hand, like anti-state, anti-taxation, total chaos. And when they first emerged in 2018, like the French left, the union movement were like, who are these guys? You know, what, what, are they, what are they doing? And there was like a hands-off. Um, uh, approach, but now if you look at um, what's happened, there's been there's an argument that's consistently made that you've seen like the gilet jaunification of the French left. The French unions are actually linking up with the lower middle classes, and one of the benefits of that is it's moved protests out of the cities into rural areas because you know people always wonder like, oh I can't believe the far right is on the march in like rural areas, or well, you know all the young people in the left just all live in cities, so no one lives in those, but you know no one engages in those places. So it's through linking up with the, that, that movement they've, they've started to build a class alliance. So that's where we should be looking. Catherine? Um, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball. On the one hand, I feel more optimistic because at least within the um, union movement in the United States, there are like real ideological struggles for what should be done. There wasn't even that room for that before. So the Teamsters Union are, and the UPS Union actually is showing itself to be much more... Um, radicals and other unions. Um, the bad part of the story, maybe you know all about the Amazon organization. Amazon should be unionized, but the leader who came out, Chris Smalls, immediately got absorbed by the mediatic, like PMC. He became a media darling, and he and um, that threw all of the organization into disarray because um, so many people wanted to embrace Chris Smalls as you know the the working class hero. And I think that's a really dangerous and effective move for um, PMC media types to defang union movements. So there has to be like real discipline, I think, from the ground up to create um, union organizations that are politically um, savvy, that have political education, that bring up leaders who aren't these like um, just, you know, charismatic media types who then you know completely betray the movement. But Right now, it's still small, but there's more un worker unrest every day. I think that solidarity has to be at the forefront. I'm also skeptical of white collar unions, so I think the real, the, in a real honest ideological struggle is the best we can hope for now. Not fake culture wars, not um, you know illusory, um, you know doing judo in jello in the jello of neoliberalism, but real ideological confrontations. That's the only way we're going to move forward. And you know that the technocratic, you know, PMC information elite, they don't want this. So you can see more and more censorship for at every level of media right now. But um, at the same time, there's so much anger about this that um, I am hoping that we can get to a point where we can have 
more honest political struggles. And that's all, that's all I can hope for right now in the mm -hmm. United States. But it's military um, sort um, competitive foreign policy is keeping a lot of people in line right now across the world. So that's like super scary. Okay. So yeah, a bit of prognosis at, at the end. Um, I'm not sure I actually agree with the two of you and I can expand on that later. <laughs> Just leave that cryptic comment. Um, but I wanted to give anybody who would like to ask some questions the chance to, uh, to do so. So, that, I think that's a hand up at, at the back. Hi, um, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm a really big fan of yours, and so glad to be able to speak. But I guess something that I've wondered is about the way race sort of functions in this model of the DNC. Um, because I kind of see like a really unproductive form of white guilt sort of dominating the way the PMC thinks about its like political duty. But at the same time, I wonder whether like the PMC is capacious enough to think about, um, you know, like intersectionality beyond just like racial reductionism. Um, and I guess that ties to, like a sort of maybe second question I have about um, I know you often get charged with like being self-hating <laughs> and like oh, what? I, I like the model of the PMC as being like a very self-hating model. So I kind of wonder about just like some of the generative capacities of the PMC, like. I know there's like obviously distrust in like white collar unions, but um, like is grad grad unionization in university campus is one way forward. It's not um it's not self hatred it's hatred of neighbours we've we established this. Um, I want to I want to take a few a few questions oh, before we oh, make okay. um, if if, if there are down. if there are any more I, I can throw a couple in there no yeah. Uh, yeah really enjoyed the talk thank you both so much. I've uh, got a question about the. Jonification of the French left, and I was thinking about uh, petty bourgeois movements in the UK, and I was thinking about the potential. Is there a just stop oilification of the British left possible? A what? What? A just stop oilification? Yeah. Any, any more? We'll, we'll, we'll take we'll take a few rounds, um, but uh, Catherine, you first. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think you know I don't think that there's any just I, I want to be sure that I understand the second part of your question, which is that you, you're you asking me whether or not the PMC can accept intersectionality within its um, ideological framework. I think it invented intersectionality. Intersectionality comes from an essay by Kimberly Crenshaw about tort law. And this is what PMC believes like politics is, is the reparation of tort. <laughs> It's created a complete legal framework where social justice is about injury to me in this individualistic way, and how do I get reparations for my injury? So that is, when I hear intersectionality, I hear the end of solidarity, the end of universalism. I hear this kind of like layering on of different identities so that I can have a particular form of injury that's different from all other forms of injury. I think it's useful in a court of law, in a racist society, in a sexist society, but I'm not really sure it's useful, except in a kind of historical way to look at what the PMC is grasping for in its vision of a just society, because it is um, a purely technocratic, um, legalistic understanding of political conflict and actually doesn't take into account the thing that we all suffer from, even the centimillionaires who are like looking up at the billionaires, exploitation. So, I, and its whole idea of adjudication of wrongs comes back to tort law. And so I just feel like it's a fundamental incomprehensible in lack of understanding about politics, it's willful lack of understanding about politics, and it's about trying to create like legalistic frameworks in which to understand harm. So that's so I'm gonna move it to you in the question okay. about sorry. Um yeah the just stop oilification of the left is uh that's a good term. <laughs> um is that an environmental? I, I mean, for for years, people have said like the, the biggest gulf in the UK is the, or not just the UK, but across the world, is the, there's no uh, 
dialogue or there's no link up between the environmental movement and the labour movement. Um, and it's a massive problem. And if you look at the UK, obviously, one of the biggest issues is you've got this sort of quite crude workerism with like the GMB saying, oh, actually, we need new, we need more uh, nuclear weapons, we need more military spending uh, to safeguard like workers' jobs. We need um, don't want a green new deal because it's gonna it, anything that sort of loses jobs, things like that. Um, I mean, the just stop. I, I sort of wish, in a way, that there was a just stop oilification um, because I think one of the biggest problems we've got in the UK. Is if you're going to break with labourism, and I do, I mean, my personal opinion is that we do need to break with labourism. You have to break with all the forms and norms and ways of doing politics that labourism involves. You know, so it's not just even if you start a new party, which is obviously always mooted. We need a new party, new new party of the left. Well, if you need, you have a new party of the left, and you do exactly the same thing. You're just focusing on parliament and electoralism. You're going to replicate the same problems. People are still going to be disenfranchised because. Democracy ends up being, I just vote for us every four years or whatever. Um, so it was really refreshing for me to see the uh, the rise of direct action in the UK because direct action is actually really normalised and it's got a really long tradition in Wales. Um, you know, Kandathas, my girlfriend Mabley was the former head of Kandathas, uh, probably the I'd say the most effective direct action group in the whole of possibly the whole of Europe in terms of safe, safeguarding the uh, the Welsh language, but. It's clear from what happens in the Just Stop Oil protest that a lot of people in, well, seem to me from the British left, just literally don't understand what direct action is. You know, you're so used to a particular way of doing politics. This is what politics looks like. People just didn't understand it. So I wish you know, there was this uh, embrace of a wave of dark, uh, direct action. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily see it happening happening yet. Although it should, you know, we have to express, you know, show solidarity with some of these uh, organisers. Unfortunately, I'm worried that they're all just going to get jailed. <laughs> Um, because they are, you know, they're getting like serious jail sentences, and eventually that's gonna that's gonna take its toll. I actually think one of the biggest uh, missed opportunities, and we can talk about this later, was possibly um, uh, the consumerism thing of don't pay. Uh, I thought that was something that would have uh, transcended, uh, become a de facto um, class alliance in the realm of consumption. Um, and there are multiple reasons why that didn't take on, but I think that um, that might be that might be the sort of more more realistic. I'm not, I obviously hope there is more direct action, but I think um, the consumer thing would be good as well. Um, I, Catherine, I wanted to come back to you. The, the first part of the question about the race in the PMC and unproductive white guilt. I'm not sure you. Oh start. right, oh right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, as someone who doesn't feel white guilt, it's really hard for me to deal with people who want to display their guilt and use it as a weapon in political organizations and academic organizations. Um, as someone who is not a Christian, I find it very much um, a crypto-Christian form of confession. And I'm really disturbed by how um, all of these religious rituals remain and obtain in allegedly secular and liberal societies. So cancellation is the um, uh, equivalent of excommunication. Uh, white guilt is this kind of confession. And there's, this, um, and there's a kind of church where you proclaim, um, your, where you display your virtue. This is why, I mean, I could have gone further and talked about you know, virtue as this pursuit of the PMC and its monopolization of the language of virtue in a secular in a secular world a world that should be secular, but its seizure of the power of the discourse and persuasion in these crypto Christian ways because it's not just religious it's very very Christian and part of it has to do with um, the the Christian idea of being everyone marked by original sin and then the those who are the most you know adept at confession um, end up being the most progressive I think. That's just, I don't know, I, I, I just think that's bullshit. I mean, and um, it goes against every bone in my body because it also, um, what it does is it um, creates this crypto-Christian way of dealing with liberal politics right now is actually making a major sin out of skepticism and criticality. Like, if you're skeptical of anyone's, confession like you're basically like a demon you know you're a sa you're satanic and i feel like we've created all of these forms of um of um 
it's beyond political correctness. It's like in internalized forms of um, um, sanctity that absolutely prevents the sort of ideological confrontation that I look forward to as our only way out of these impasses. Interesting. PMC finds religion, maybe. Yeah, we've got a couple mm -hmm. questions here. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would prefer to say it's a Christian heresy <laughs> Christianity, exactly. I think it's more a kind of Manichaeanism, but yeah, it's certainly a return of, of the desire for ritual. Um, but, but that wasn't what I was going to say, but I appreciated everything that you were saying. Um, I had kind of a question about, I'm not sure how to, how to put it, but so, something to do with the relationship between the kind of populism which exists um, in many and in many places in, in Europe, which is tied often to a sort of resurgent nationalism. Um, and there seems to be a kind of missing concomitant internationalism on the part of the left in the sense that it is un unwilling and unable precisely to have, let's say, difficult conversations about labor rights, uh, immigration and so on, um, or about uh, reality, <laughs> basic questions of like how we agree the world works and what we value um, in terms of things like family, um, where we live and so on. Which, which seeds uh, all the grounds to, to anyone who comes along and says, well, we can have a conversation about this, I'm on your side, I support your family, we're against these crazy ultra-left ideas like family abolition, and so on and so forth, which uh, you've discussed on your um, podcast. And I'm just wondering, you know, uh, you get an inverted image of, the, of internationalism in the almost conspiracy idea of globalism. Um, and I'm just wondering how if there is a link perhaps between a kind of possible left populism, I know it was kind of tried with Corbynism um, and, and Sandersism, if mm -hmm. that's a word, yeah. um, <laughs> Bernieism, um, and, and a reclaiming of an internationalism which at the same time recognizes the things that people value, where they live, and, and who they care about, and, and yeah, how, how that would relate to nationalism in its resurgent form. Ooh, good question, good, difficult good, one. Great question. Um, Glad that you two have to answer it, not me. <laughs> we'll, 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 take a, we'll take a few. Oh, we'll take a round. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, just to echo also what everyone else has said, thank you. you know, how interesting it is. It's, yeah, it's been great to hear all of your ideas and things. Um, I, I was curious about what you said about intersectionality. I kind of wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. Um, because when it comes to these kind of conversations about um, class and anti-capitalism, I've always felt that anti-capitalism and, and um, sort of class movements need to be the foundation of a lot of social revolution. But I've also always felt that the insufficient, if not paired, the intersectionality, so from like a gender or a race lens, if we had a huge anti-capitalist movement but it didn't challenge those power narratives around gender or race, then some people are like, what's the point? You might change the economic distribution, but I'm still going to live within this structure of gender or race, right? And so I've always felt that intersectionality is central if you actually want to get everyone on board in an anti-capitalist movement. And for that reason, we need alliances, not just across class, but across ideologies with these kind of ideas of identity, which sometimes all end up kind of undermining each other. And so I guess my question is about how to um, form those alliances with intersectional lenses and, and anti-capitalist lenses. Another, another difficult one. Um, do we have a, th a third question in this round? Yeah. Um. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to pick up on the point about the. I suppose I. I suppose I'd say. I'd, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that there's a sort of theistic provenance behind the sort of core commitments of liberalism as I understand it. So, you know, I think I think the, you know, making these comparisons. Um, I mean, as a Christian myself, I, I consider. Liberalism to be a kind of um, bad theology, um, and I think sort of late modern people have apparently embraced secularism, but they've they still they still have retained the habit of belief, um, and their human beings evidently need to believe in something. And the problem is, you know, if you don't give them something credible. They'll believe in anything, as, as has been said. So I think, um, yeah, that's what I'd say. There's a definite. It's impossible to imagine egalitarianism, individualism, um, without understanding its relation to Christian theology. 
Another another tricky one. So three three difficult questions, Catherine. You, you look uh, you look you look I'm ready. To go. Yeah, I'm ready. You're ready you to think, go. You think they're hard, but okay, no. just knock them out of the park one no, by one. No. Okay, so what? So number one, um, you talk about gender and race, right, as necessary components of the revolution, and I think absolutely right. But I'd like to get back to the. You don't talk about racism. I am a radical Enlightenment person. I don't think we are there at enlightenment yet. I and I'll come back to the religion thing in a second, but the narrative that Marx sets into motion that was set into motion, unfortunately, in the 18th century in Europe because of reason, the and Descartes in the 17th century, it happened here. Um, it is the legacy and the right of every human being to be able to exercise their reason and to um, possess part of the scientific method as well as the tradition of every literature in the world, is that race, racial difference, was invented by a racist society. So why are we saying, like, we need to attend to race here? We need to abolish that difference from its root and look at the universalism of exploitation, of class. You see what I mean? So gender, too, is this core of irrationality that is part of our, in, the hatred of women, or misogyny is deeply embedded in, in our religion, in our culture, etc. Yes, we, need, we must need to stamp that out, but it's not going to be like a confession. It has to be in terms of forms. When you take away um, the material power of the family wage earner. When you give national health care to women in America so they can leave their abusive husbands because they don't be have health insurance without them, that liberates women. So I'm talking about emancipation. Let's look at a revolution that affects us all. Let's not reify race or gender. We are on a mission here, if we are religious or not, to endow our the meaning of our lives, and I think this is the grand narrative, and we have to address, we have to reject the postmodernist rejection of the grand narrative. Is that we have to make everyone feel like they're part of a universal struggle for equality, for dignity, for freedom, and we've completely lost that. And you know what? Part of that struggle is a collective struggle in which we have to bring back a term that I think is important in Christianity, even if I'm not religious, is sacrifice. And we've let the right have sacrifice. We've let the right have um, notions of nation or the collective. You know, I don't believe in God, but I do believe there is something divine about a collective universal struggle for freedom. And if we, and I would just urge us not to use the reified forms of difference in narrativizing that struggle. Good answer. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll take the one on the nationalism, uh, internationalism, and then the, I'll try in the sectionality one. Um, yeah, so I never thought I'd be like an advocate of like civility politics or, you know, like, be kind online or things like that. But um, I do... Be kind online. That's be a kind movement. online, yeah. Um, mm. No, but I, t but I, do, in I do increasingly... Uh, Worry. Uh, although I tried to write my book, and I tried, I always try to come across now or these days as like you know comradely and trying to. Um, and I think maybe I work, you know, leaving academia for five years and working with you know the homeless, um, people with you know prison leavers, you know veterans, people with very chaotic politics, um, and working in a an environment where you know, you can't you you have san san sanctimony in that environment is the the worst possible. Um, you just can't be a, a support worker if you're looking down on people, if you're judging them, and there has to be understanding. And I think when I've come back to sort of politics, um, so it seems like such a basic thing, but um, having to sort of be able to have conversation with people, having the space to win people over, uh, being able to meet people where they're at, you know, you should just be a fundamental uh, principle. It's certainly a fundamental principle if you do, do any workplace organising. You, know, you, you, you have to speak to people with respect. I've increasing, I am increasingly worried um, about this sort of sanctimony uh, on the left, this idea that we can't talk about these things um, because you know, 
things like immigration uh, to take some common slogans, you know, like open borders, abolish the police, abolish the family. Um, these are all really nuanced topics. I often don't think the slogans actually mean what they what they mean. Um, you know, we have to be, you know, in, and the fact that people are, and, I, and a lot of the people who use the slogans definitely have a more nuanced understanding of these topics than other people who sort of wield them. But like, in, in terms of the, I'm rounding a bit, but in terms of the international, is and the open borders thing. I was struck by uh, you know, Angela Nagel's article on open borders, um, for which uh, you know she was against open borders, and she got sort of cancelled for it and denounced as a fascist. And then you know I, to my eternal shame, back when I was first on Twitter, people were like, oh, this Angela Nagel, she's like a, like a Nazi or whatever. And I was like, well, enough people are saying it. Like she must be really bad. Like and you sort of buy into that. And then you know I read this article. And I was like, oh, that's really tame. Like this, this article is literally essentially the, the Communist Party of Britain's policy on on immigration has been for for years. You know, the, 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 um, one of the aspects of migration in the UK has been that it's actually bad to have a, a system where which takes poor workers from you know the global south, which essentially contributes to the in, in further impoverishment of these countries. Um, and then you see the sort of like the, the left narrative, which is de facto a liberal narrative of like. Oh, this is so awesome! You know, we've got all these like nurses from the Philippines like helping the NHS and uh, things like that. And you think, okay, well, it's also contributing to the um, marginalisation of, of, of those sort of emerging economies because we're taking all their their workers. Um, and you know, you have to have a you have to be able to have conversations about about these things. Like you know, if you abolish abolish the, abolish the police is another classic example. You know, all the statistics show that working class communities, including those that are brutalised by the police want more police. That's a really awkward conversation we have to have. You know, it's, it, it, it doesn't mean that um, we have to give up on this idea of creating a, a fairer uh, criminal justice system. Absolutely, I'm, I'm all for uh, total reformation of the criminal justice system, but we have to work out ways of, of speaking to people and having these difficult conversations which don't, you said, totally cede ground to, to the right and cede these topics to the right. And equally, like, abolish the family, family abolition just means the extension of care, from what I can understand, which is a, it's a, it's a far better topic. But um, if uh, I think if we, if we got to the point where we're we're more obsessed with slogans, and um, that's a sign that we're retreating into a subculture, if you if if because these are just norms and words that people are wielding um, without having debate on them. These are just sign these are just signifiers. Um, yeah, on, Catherine, sorry. Um, I just want to add very quickly about the. Um um, internationalism. We're lacking international solidarity. Yeah. I just had a conversation on um, WhatsApp with they. Well, I didn't wasn't part of it, but um, there were leftists talking about the decline in manufacturing jobs in the United States. We all think that's bad. And then one of them actually said, "Well, when Chinese manufacturing collapses, that'll be good for us." And then someone says, "Oh no, then all those jobs will just go to Vietnam and Indonesia and the Philippines." And I'm thinking, what happened to working class solidarity? We see China as a competitor. If Chinese workers demanded better wages, then the wage floor would go up for all workers. And, and, and we should demand that wage floor goes up in all manufacturing jobs. But even leftists don't have this sense of, like, the fact that the working class is in it together. Oops. Okay, that's Have I got time to talk about intersectionality or not? Very, very quickly, <laughs> which, you, which you probably can't do, so I'll set you up to fail there. Uh, for, for um, you but can't it, talk, Dan, please. You're a white man, please be quiet. Thank you. Um, for me, there's like a distinction between, you know, uh, intersectionality as a sort of analytic term and then intersectionality, how it actually seems to be applied within, within organising. Obviously, that might seem patronising, but like on the one hand, you know, Intersectionality in terms of recognizing that you know, reproductive labor um, is extremely important, is key to sort of capitalist accumulation, understanding that you know, the, the class system is global, that uh, capitalism in, involves the hyper exploitation of, of women, of, of people in the global south. It, it, for me, that's just like a, should be a basic way of understanding like the, you know, the class structure. The problem, obviously, is that. In my experience, how things like intersectionality actually applied when you're trying to organise on the ground actually involves extremely divisive behaviours uh, and sort of virtue signalling 
all of which are sort of uh, described by Catherine in her book. So I think it's the problem is people overcompensate. You know, you see this sort of essentially behaviour which amounts to wrecking a lot of the time in sort of left movements, um, and then people go, "Well, I, I hate intersectionality, or I hate identity politics," but it's actually just they're not the same. I don't think. Any any final very short questions? And I'm I'm aware it's very warm in this room. They I think it's the Francis Crick Centre's fault because they turn the air conditioning off at at uh, seven. So it could just be it could just be sabotaged by by our class enemies. That's also a possible explanation. Um, but if there are no more questions uh, now, then you're all very uh, cordially invited to come to the King Charles the First pub. Um, I don't think cordially enough that there's money behind the bar for free drinks but <laughs> still cordial enough please do please do come um so it just remains for me to say thank you so much to Catherine and to Dan